Okay. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. And we are ready for our Zohar class. Uh, today is a very interesting and fascinating Zohar class that uh, we are going to be going through. <clears throat> I think it has a lot to do with um, the times that we are in. Uh, and in particular, I, I felt that this would be perfect uh, to be able to learn this part of the Zohar. Uh, what we want to learn is about something very fascinating in the Torah, uh, in the desert, during the 40 years when the Jewish people were traveling. As you recall, there was a certain point that there was a rebellion against Moses, and uh, which came in from within the nation itself, the Torah portion of Korach, and at a certain point, there was wrath of God that got um, inflamed against the Jewish people. And there was suddenly a sickness that God released within the Jewish nation in the desert, and they started to die. So I want to go through the text of what it was that happened at that point and some fascinating uh, lessons that we could learn in today's time. So, okay. I have uh, posted a document in the chat section um, for everyone to be able to use. This is going to be the collection of the text that we are going to be learning today. So I would like to ask everyone to, uh, if you could, and if you want, open the document. And we are going to learn it now together. All right. And I am going to open it up, make it bigger. All right. So in the document, the first page, by the way, the document is sitting in the chat section. If you haven't um, looked for it, please look for it now. It's the chat section of this class, and the document has been posted. We're going to start with the first page of the document, which is the Torah reading itself. We're going to start with that. It says, Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe Lemor, and the Lord spoke to Moshe, to Moses, saying, so this is telling you the story of God getting angry at the Jewish people and says, you should stand aside from this congregation. And I'm going to de destroy them immediately. And, uh, and Moshe, of course, was really disturbed by this. And they right away, they fell on their face, so to say, uh, because of this uh, news that God gave them. So what did Moses do? Moses ran to Aaron, verse number 11. By Yomer Moshe Aaron and Moses told Aaron, Kach es hamachto, you should take the pan, the special frying pan that you have, the special vessel. Veten aleha esh mal hamizbeach, you should take a fire from the altar. Vesim keteres. And you should put the incense, which is in Hebrew is called ketoret. It's something that you burn, has smell. And put it in there. And go immediately to the congregation, to the Jewish people. And you should atone for them. Because the anger has now come forth from Hashem, Hechel HaNegev, and the sickness, the disease has started. So here, Moses is forewarning Aaron that now there is a disease that has been released into the Jewish nation because of God's anger. And now go do this in order to stop it. He sends Aaron with the special frying pan, says put the ketoret, the incense in it, burn it with the fire from the altar, and go. So verse number 12 in the Torah portion of Korah says, 
Vayikach Aaron ka'asher diber Moshe. So Aaron took exactly as Moses had instructed. Vayorotz el teicha kohol, and he ran to the congregation, to the Jewish people. Vehine hechol hanegev, and he saw indeed, it's exactly like what Moses said, that the disease had already started and people were dying. It has started in the nation. So he put the ketoret, the incense, into it, into the frying pan. And he atoned for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague ceased. The disease just ceased. And it finishes off to say what the fatalities were, the ones that died through this plague, where Arbo Osar Elef, Ushva Me'ez, 14,700 people, Nivad Hamesim Al Vakairach, that's besides the people that died earlier, because this came as an aftermath of the whole episode with Korach, which rebelled against Moses, and there was people that died then too. So just for this episode itself, it was 14,700. By Yoshev Aaron El Moshe El Pesach Ohel Moed, and Aaron returned to Moses, who was there at the entrance of the tent of meeting. and the plague stopped. So this is the episode that happened in the desert. Well, Moses utilized this, the Ketoret, to stop the plague amongst the Jewish people. Now, what exactly? is the Ketoret, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna come to read what exactly the Ketoret is, but now I wanna dive into, immediately, into what the Zohar has to say about the Ketoret, about the incense. What was it? What's the secret in there that causes the plague to stop? So we are now on the Zohar text. There's two different excerpts that uh, we have chosen. The first one is in the Torah portion of Bayechi, page 130, page 1. And the Zohar says, V'so chazi ketedis mekasher kishrin. Come and see how the ketoret, this incense, was connecting and unifying the upper sephirot together because the meaning of the word ketoret of Hebrew itself is connection, to connect. The ochid le'el of the and this was grabbing uh, and uniting the upper and the lower levels. And the ketoret, the incense, was removing the plague and any sort of heavenly accusations and any anger so that it should not have any dominion in the world. As it says in the verse in the Torah, which we just read, that Moses told Aaron, take the, the pan, send Aleha Esh and put a fire on it, Malam is there from the altar, Vasin Katadas and and put the Katadas, the incense in it to burn. And the verse says how he ran, uh, he told him go run right away, and Aaron did exactly what Moses said. And afterwards it says, he ran, etc. And it atoned for the people. And it says in the verse that he stood between the living and between the dead and the living. And the plague stopped. Why is that? Because the ketoret, the incense, the mitzvah of burning those special uh, incense, the, that special mixture has a special power that all the bad powers of the world cannot withstand in front of the ketoret when it's being burnt. 
And therefore, the ketoret, the burning of the ketoret, is what creates joy for all, in other words, in all levels of the world, including the spiritual realms, and it ties everything together. And in this section of the Zohar, it goes on to talk about how there is particular times for the burning of the ketoret, of the incense, according to the Torah, and how those times that is prescribed in the Torah for burning of it on a regular basis are times when usually there is the level of severity of Gevura shining down into the world. And that's why those times have been designated usually for the burning of the incense. We, of course, we're talking about when the temple, the Beis HaMikdash, was still in its place. These days, of course, we no longer burn the incense. We don't even really fully know how to create the mixture. We have a pretty good idea, but not fully, fully, 100% as we're going to learn. Now I want to jump into another reading of the Zohar. This one, which is in the handouts that I have given you, is on page three. And this one is in the section of Vayakel, the Torah portion of Vayakel, which is volume two of the book of Zohar, page 218. And that's on page two of 218. So here, we're going to be coming at the middle of a topic. And the Zohar prior to this reading is talking about how the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would wear a special headpiece that would sit on his forehead that said, Kadosh Hashem, holy unto God. And it says that this would sit on the forehead of the Kohen Gadol in a miraculous way, and it has special powers. And the Zohar talks about how if there was anyone, even somebody that had sinned, would see this piece sitting on the forehead of the high priest of the Kohen Gadol, it would cause him to repent and completely change his ways. If anybody saw it, the way miraculously it was sitting right there on his forehead and, and the letters that were there, it would automatically create thoughts of repentance in a person. So it had a supernatural power, this uh, piece that sit, was sitting on the Kohen's forehead. So now the Zohar continues here, and the text is right there on page three in your handout, and says, the same thing exactly was with the ketores, with the burning of the incense. Call man the arach that whoever would smell that smoke of the ketoret that would be rising, when the smoke would be rising from the burning of the ketoret because the mixture of the ketoret, how they used to make it, and again, soon we're going to be reviewing that, had also an extra ingredient in there that would cause smoke. And this smoke would rise up in a straight line rather than being spread all over the place. So whoever smelled the smell of this ketoret, that would refine the person's heart to become completely pure and to want to serve his creator with a complete heart. It would draw the person close. And the effect of the yitzhahara, of the evil inclination of the animal soul, which is in the person, would actually be drastically reduced or removed from the person that would smell the, the smoke of the ketoret. And in that case, once 
the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, would be removed from the person, then the person would be removed with just one heart, and that is of the godly soul, to serve his father in the heavens above. Begin the Keteres Teviru the Yetzirah Ihu, Vadai Bechol Sitrin, because the Ketoret was surely what was breaking the power of the Yetzirah, of the evil inclination, from all sides. The same way that the tzitz, which was the name of that piece, the golden piece sitting on the forehead of the coin Godel, used to stand there miraculously, it wouldn't fall. And whoever would look at it would end up repenting and returning to Hashem. The same thing with the ketoret, which was, had this miraculous value because its smell would would suddenly cause a person to completely want to serve God out of total devotion. Because there's nothing in the world as strong as the ketoret, the burning of the ketoret and the smell of it that would break apart the sitra akra, the yitzhara, the evil inclination. So ta'chaz in makasib. Come and see what it says in the Torah itself, the Zohar continues. The Moshe tells Aaron, My time. So Moses goes ahead and tells Aaron, take the frying pan, take the fire from the altar, and put the ketoret in there. What's the reason for him to bring the ketoret at that point? Because the anger has not come forth from God, and therefore, the plague, the disease, has started. That there was no way to break it up other than utilizing the ketoret, because the ketoret is the most powerful thing to break apart the forces of impurity. Because there is nothing that is more dear uh, for God than the ketoret. The kaima levato, of course, that by itself needs a whole segue of explanation of why is it that it's so special uh, in the eyes of God, the burning of the ketoret, but that's a whole different topic related to this that the Zohar will discuss at a different point. The kaima levato, and the ketoret is always capable of standing right there to destroy any effects of, of magic, of uh, black magic, or devoting, and, and, and bad things from a person's household. Even Rechov Ashona Dictatus of the Bene Nosha, and even the smell and the smoke of the Ketoret, that, that if people would do it, just regular people, would be able to cancel out and destroy any uh, uh, power of impurity of magic. So how much more so, so how much more so when it was done in the setting of the temple under the, the commandment of Hashem and done by a Kohen, by the Kohen Gadol, it was that much more powerful, that it was able to completely eradicate the powers of impurity. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai continues and says, This is a covenant that has been established by God. The whole man is tackled. Here is this is where I want you to all pay really good attention. This is one of those fascinating teachings of the Torah that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, says that this is already an established covenant with God from ever, that whoever thinks about and reads every day the making, the formula of how to make the ketoret, the incense, yishtezev mikol milin bishin, the harshin the almod, the person would be saved from all evil things from all sorts of magic that would be in the world will be called pegain bishin and from all sorts of bad things that might happen to him and from bad thoughts 
umidina bisha and from bad decrees umosana and from if any plague from any disease or plague vela yisa kol hahu yema and that day when a person reads how to make the ketoret, the formula of the ketoret, for that day he would be protected or she would be protected from all of these things. That the side of the impurity would not be able to have any sort of dominion over this person. However, a person has to pay attention to it when the person is reading it. You should think into it. It shouldn't be just uh, something that you're saying, formula, and okay, good, I got it over with. Oma Rabbi Shimon. So Rabbi Shimon continues and he tells his friends, Ibe Nosha have a yod de kama ilo'a, ihu ovada dictators, kame kucha birichu. If people, if humankind would know how important it is, the this formula, the making of the ketoret in front of Hashem. Have a not like called Mila or Mila Mine, then people would take every word of the formula of how it is commanded to make it, and the have a salkele atara reshahu kechisa that the dava, and they would use every word as a crown for themselves as though it was a crown made out of gold. Umande shtadelbe, and whoever learns. The, the Torah portion of the Ketoret, the Torah portion that talks about the commandment of making the Ketoret, he has to think with his mind about the making of the Ketoret. And if he would have concentration and, and, and meditation about this every day, then he has a share in this world and in the world to come. Be stalling my son amine ume alma, and any matter of plagues and disease would be removed from him uh, and from the entire world. Be shteziv me called din in the high alma, and it would be saved from all the judgments of this world. Me sitrin bishin and medina de gehenom and medina de malfo afra from all the evil powers of this world from even judgment in, in the afterlife, in what we call purgatory, and also from the, any control of the side of impurity. Ketoret, that's, this is all accomplished with that ketoret that a person would learn. We we'll continue. Kad have a solid to nono ba'amuda when the ketoret would be burned. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai continues. There would be a column of smoke that would be rising up. Kahano have a chome aspon de rosa dishma kadisha. And the Kohen Gadol, the high priest that would be burning it, he actually would be able to, at that point, when the smoke would be rising, he would be able to see what normally cannot be seen, and that is to see letters, letters of the secrets of what is going on, actually rising with the smoke. Parchin ba'aviron, shahayu porchos ba'avir, they would rise and they would be flying in the air and they would be breaking barriers. And it would be going up with that column of smoke. And then afterwards, what would the Kohen see? He would see chariots, holy chariots that are dominating in the air of the world, and they would be going around uh, with the smoke of the ketoret that was rising, and it would be filling up everywhere. At the solid bin hiru v'chedva, until it reached the, the high, a very high level, and it was all done in, in, in a way that brought about great joy. V'chadei l'man v'chadei, and it would actually bring joy to the person, to, to the entity that needs to be experiencing joy, 
And what was that? The one that actually has pleasure from the burning of the Ketoret, which was the Shekhinah, the omnipresent. And the Ketoret would be making connections between the different levels in the heavenly, in the heavenly spheres above. And the Yachda Kola would bring all of them together to create a parts of, to create a, a whole image. These are again heavy words of the Zohar, each one is explanation, but for those that have been in the previous classes uh, of, of Zohar and you have learned about the Ten Sefirot, it's referring to how it would actually create a unification of different uh, Sefirot out of the Ten Sefirot. Many of them would now be tied together through the Ketoret. The Haokimna, and this is already what was explained before, and he finishes here, and this Ketoret would atone for uh, any shortcoming uh, that was caused in a, in a person's soul because of the evil inclination and or because of any sort of idol worshipping that would come from the side of impurity. And we have already now, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, we have already explained everything to the group that is sitting here. And I don't mean necessarily here, here, but you are also here. But he's referring to the ones, the sages that were sitting with him. But of course, now in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we have also somewhat explained to the group that is sitting here uh, virtually with us uh, about the amazing power of the burning of the Ketoret. So this is what the Zohar HaKadosh, the Holy Zohar has to say about this uh, amazing mitzvah that God has given us and what it accomplishes and what we saw that Moses told Aaron to do in order to stop the uh, Magefa, the plague. So it comes out from the teachings of the Zohar that even though we no longer have the temple these days, and therefore we are not allowed to, and we don't have the framework in which we would offer the ketoret, the incense burning on a daily basis. However, just by learning it and by saying it, by understanding what you're saying, and by having a focus on what you're saying, you can create the same protection that the Ketoret offered the Jewish people and the world at the time when it was being done. So now, uh, what's beautiful for you to know is the fact that the Ketoret and the process of it is actually part of our daily prayers. It's in the prayer book. That's one of the reasons why the sages established it as part of the daily prayer book. And usually it's written uh, before the beginning of the daily prayer as a minion. In other words, normally when you come to the prayer uh, minion, whether it's on a weekday or on the day of Shabbat, when the chazan starts, after the Kaddish is said, he starts from Haidu. Okay, Haidu Lashem Ki Rishmai, Haidu Bamim Ali Laiso. However, before that, in the prayers, for example, in the Sidurim, in the prayer books that we use, usually we start the prayers at page 181 on Shabbat. But before that, there is the preparatory reading. And the, the preparatory reading has included in it all matters relating to the sacrifices that were brought in the temple, as well as the ketoret, the burning of the incense. Now, in the handout that I have um, shared with you, um, we also have that portion of the Siddur. And for all those that came into the class a little bit later, I have just uh, posted the document in the chat section of our class again. So give it 30 more seconds, it will fully upload, and then you could click on it and download it. So in the handouts, we are now on page five, okay? 
So if you open page five, you will see the Hebrew and English uh, translation of the Ketoret, the way it is written in the Torah, commanded by us to make. So it starts, um, let's see here. Okay, so it's towards the bottom of the page where it says, you are Hashem our God and the God of our Father before whom our ancestors burned the Ketoret spices when the Besamikdash stood as you commanded them through Moshe Rabbeinu, your Navi, your prophet, as it, it is written in the Torah. So now it starts quoting from the Torah where it talks about it and what it says. So let's go through those verses on page five of the handout. Vayomer Hashem el Moshe, and God said to Moshe, Kach lecha samim, you should take the following spices for yourself. And then it goes to enumerate them. And each one translated here, I'm not even sure if I, if I know the correct scientific word for these things. So um, if I'm not mistaken, it's translated uh, Stasty, Onica, Galbanum, uh, other spices, and pure frankincense. Bad Bavad Yehye, the four spices named above, should be taken in equal amounts. And by the way, uh, we do have, um, we do have uh, pictures in the same handout that I have given you. There is also pictures of uh, these things. And uh, here I could also share with you. Okay, let me share this on the screen for everyone to see. We're going to quickly run uh, down these items. Here we are. So, and share. Here we go. Okay, so now on your screen, you should be seeing the first one, which is called balsam. Okay, and there is various pictures available, of course, on uh, the internet. This was a, uh, a good one to show you the texture. Then the second one is Tsipoiren, which is called, uh, well, there's different opinions as what Tsipoiren is. And by the way, that's one of the challenges that we have these days as far as knowing exactly what those recipes were. Because even in the days of the temple, not everyone knew the secret recipe. It was closely guarded by the particular families that were assigned to create the Ketoret. And the reason why it was closely guarded was so that nobody else imitates it and would create it for their own benefit. They were worried that Estee Lauder and, and uh, other you know, companies would suddenly say, hey, that's, that's a fascinating amazing smell look at that it really you know makes people high let's that's going to be the best seller so they were worried about that and therefore it was kept uh, the the details were kept in family secrets and of course besides everything else now because uh, another two and a half thousand years have passed since uh it, the secret was known and two thousand years since the destruction of the temple some more of the details have been lost to us so according to some opinions, cloves were uh, the, the actual ingredient, which is called tsiporin in the verse. According to some opinions, it was anika. What is the difference between the two? Well, cloves, I know I use it every Saturday night for havdola, but I can't really say that, that I have used anika that often. Maybe I have, I have no idea. The third one is chalbeina or galbanum. And in that by itself, again, there's multiple opinions on what it was. According to some people, it was uh, Storex. That was the actual Chelboina that is brought in uh, the Torah. Then there was um, uh, what is called Levina, which is called frankincense. Then we have more, which is Mirth. And again, this is one opinion. There's another opinion that says it was Musk. Okay, not to be mistaken with Elon Musk. This is a completely different one. Then we have uh, Kitsia, which is Kashia. 
And again, um, then after that, we have Shibboleth Nerd. And according to one opinion, it was Spike Nard, as it was called. All right, and the color was lavender. According to another opinion, it was saffron, okay, which was the crocus bloom uh, stigmas flower. That's the, I guess, scientific name for it. Then we have uh, saffron. Of course, everyone is used to saffron, the powdered one. We use it in cooking all the time, uh, but that's what it, it was used. Then we have koshet, which is costus. Um, that is the picture of it. We have musket nut bark, which is supposed to be hilupa. And then there was again an opinion that there was, uh, the first opinion about what kinomon was, was cinnamon, according to one opinion. According to others, it was the agar wood. Okay, so those were the pictures that um, we are learning about now as far as what the ingredients were. So back to our text that we are looking at. So it says that you should use the notov, ushcheles, and chelbenos, samim, olovenos, zakot, they should all be of equal amounts. The osiso oiso ketores, and you should make it into the ketoret, into the mixture. Let's go to the next page, page five of the handout. Reikach maser that it should be expertly mixed, the ingredients, it should all be well-blended mixture, and memulach tohor kodesh, and the ketoret should stay pure and holy, it shouldn't be, shouldn't touch anything that is impure or used for any other purpose. So the mixture itself had to be kept holy. And you should make the mixture into very fine particles. It should be a well-blended mixture. I'm sorry. And every day you should take from this fine mixture and put some of it on the golden Mizbeach, which was before the ark which was in the tent of the meeting. Asher that is the place where I will be meeting you. You should treat this mixture of ketoret as holy of holies. In other words, there, there is um, different levels that different offerings would have in the temple. And there was level of holy, then there would be level of holy of holies. And this is considered to be on the upper tier. The Nemar, and it says in the Torah, the Hikti all of Aaron, Ketoret Samim, and Aaron should burn the Ketoret on the altar, on the Mizbeach. When should he burn it? Every single morning he should burn it when he's cleaning up the lamps of the menorah. The menorah would be lit every single night and it would be lit all the way till the morning. Then in the morning, Aaron would come, or the high priest, and would clean it up, clean up whatever is left of it to prepare it so that it could be relit again. And at that time when he comes to do the cleaning is when he should be burning these ketorot. And Aaron should also burn this ketores on the altar. Later in the afternoon, Yaktireno, when he wants to light the menorah, he should be also be burning the ketoret. Ketores tamid livne Hashem l'derasechem. The ketoret should always be offered before Hashem, before God, throughout all your generations. So in other words, the commandment that God gave to Moshe to be told to Aaron is that not, this is not a one-time thing that I'm telling you to do. This is to be continued always for the Jewish people. Ton Rabbanon continues over there. The, our sages taught us in the Brise, 
pizza maketeris keitzah. So now let's get, we read the commandment from the Torah that it needs to be made, but now let's understand from the oral Torah what is exactly the formula for making this. We were told some of the ingredients, but let's let's get to the bottom of the formula. Pizza maketeris keitzah. How was the ketoret prepared? So. It says at the bottom of page six in the handouts that I have given you. Shalosh me'oz v'shishim u'shmeinu monim ha'iva. That it had 368 monim. Mana is a measurement, so it had 368. And you figure that a mana is roughly about one pound. Okay, so the mixture would be a total of 368 pounds approximately speaking. That 365 would be equivalent to the days of the year, like the sun. One mana was used each day of the year. Half was used in the morning, and the other half was used in the afternoon. So that's how you get one mana used for every day, approximately one pound. So half a pound in the morning, half a pound in the afternoon, the Kohen Gadol would put it and burn it on the altar. So out of 368, now you have how much extra? If you're using 365 every day of the year, you would have three extra, right? So those three, hakipurim. <laughs> So those extra three monas, three pounds that would be left over from the yearly make of this batch of the Ketoret would be used by the Kohen Gadol to take a fistful to the, to the inside of the Holy of Holies. Um, and it would be used on Yom Kippur. And a Chafnav that he would take like he would take his, uh, uh, he, he would grab, I don't know if you could see or not. Yeah, okay, here we go. Right. Uh, is that how the surface usually hang loose or something? Okay. So, so that's, where did they get it from? They got it from the Kohens in the temple. Okay. And just, just, like, uh, uh, just like the priestly blessing of fingers became quite famous in the world and they took it from, from us, so did yeah, okay. So they would grab with their fingers, with the two of them out, they would grab some of the mixture. So he would use them on Yom Kippur. And so the Kohen would actually, prior to Yom Kippur, uh, take it, even though they were already ground up, because they were made a while before. So before Yom Kippur, he would take them again to the grinding uh, equipment and they would grind it again to make sure that it's really, really ground up, really fine. And he would do it on the eve of Yom Kippur and grind it until it was really extremely fine powder. And there were 11 main ingredients in this mixture. What were they? The Elohim, these are them. We're at the bottom of page seven in the handout. Hatsori, the balm, the Hatsipayrin, the Onika, Hachelbino, the Galbinim, the Halavino, the Frankincense, Mishko, Shiv, Im, Shiv, Im, Mone. So from these first four, there was 70 Mone of each. So that's 70 pounds of each that would be used for this mixture. Then moving on to ingredient number five, mor, the, the mir, uketsia, the kashia, shibeles nerd, and that is the spike nard. Number eight, the charkes, that's the saffron. So remember I said there is different opinions as to what each thing is, but here it's taking one opinion as to what it was and that's what it's using. So number eight was the charkum, the saffron. Mishkal, shisha, osa, shisha, osa, mone. For these four, there was 16 mone of each, which is roughly 16 pounds of each that was used. 
Hakosh, the, the ninth one, Shnei Masar, was uh, the costus uh, spice. And from that, 12 money was used, approximately 12 pounds. Number 10 was Kilupa Shalesha. That was the sweet smelling bark, which we don't exactly know what it was. There's again different opinions, but it was a sweet smelling bark. And that was three money of each. And the 11th ingredient was Kinomon Tisha, was eight money of Kinomon. According to one opinion, it was cinnamon. So altogether, the spices that were prepared were 368 money, 368 pounds. Boiris Karshina, besides these spices, there were other ingredients used in the Kateris. And Tish a cabin, they were nine cabin, about three and a half gallons of lye from Karshina. Yen Kafrisin Sein. And then there was three seas, which is about seven and three quarters of a gallon of wine from Cyprus. And if there was no Cyprus wine available, then maybe Hamar Chivarian Attic, then he could just bring old white wine that, was, that could be brought and used instead. Melach Sedem is Reva, and then also a quarter of a calf, about 17 ounces of, of salt from the area of Sodom was added. So that's a Sodomite salt, which was famous. Mala Oshon Kolshehu, and then besides all of that, there was another ingredient, something that was called Mala Oshon, something that would create a lot of smoke. And that was added not because of its smell qualities, but rather because it would make a lot of smoke. So that was added to it as well. So Rabbi Nosan Ababli Eimer, and Rabbi Nosan from Babylonia said, Im kipas ayarden kolsh, af kipas ayarden kolshehi, that a small amount of amber that grew next to the Jordan River was also added. Ve'im Nosan bought the vash, psala. And if they would have added any honey to it, even though honey would have a, a wonderful smell, but they were not allowed to add any honey to it because it would completely make everything puzzle and not fit. And if there was anything, any ingredient missing from these main ingredients, then not only it wasn't kosher, but the person creating it would be deserving of death. Okay, so it, it was a holy ingredient and formula, the entire thing, it had to be adhered to exactly. Continue at the bottom of page eight. Rabban Shimo ben Gamliel Eimer. Rabban Shimo, the son of Gamliel, said, Hatsari eino elos sirof ha native ma'atsayaktov. So we spoke about the, all the ingredients, but now what is every single one of them? So there was some of them that they had different opinions. So he said that the ball mentioned above is simply the juice that drips from the balsam tree. Boiris Karshino, the lye from Karshino was used for scrubbing the anika, Shoshofim Boisatipirin, Kedei Shetehe Noe, so that it, it look pleasant. So in order to make the spice look pleasant, they use that ingredient. Yen Kafrisin, we're now on top of page nine. Wine of Cyprus was used, Shoshofim Boisatipirin, how was it used? It was used, it wasn't one of the main 11 ingredients, but it was needed, was used because they would soak the anika in it, so that the anika would have even a stronger smell. And although the water from raglaim would be better than Cypress wine for making the anika smell strong, what was Meiraglaim here, which doesn't translate here exactly, it would actually be, it would be the urine. Urine has a special power, it's strong. But they can't use such thing, even though the sages said, hey, isn't that like, we know that could cause uh, activation, like chemical activation that would create an exemplary strong smell in some of these spices. They say, yeah, 
but because of respect, you're not allowed to, to utilize such an ingredient because of respect of where the ketoret is going to be offered. Tanya, we continue at the middle of page nine that it's been taught in the Beraise. In the Mishnah, Rabbi Nassan Eimer, Rabbi Nassan says, Keshehu Sheikhek, there is additional instructions for making this ketore. Not only all the ingredients have to be there and in the right amount and so on and so forth, but also this is a very spiritual thing. So when the person is grinding the ketore, Omer Hadek Hetev Hetev Hadek, he should say, that grind it thin and then it should be grounded. Why? Because the voice of the person that is saying it while he's doing it actually has an effect on the besamim, on the spices. Fascinating. If only half of the 368 monim of ketoret was ground in the proper portion, kashera it will still be kosher. In other words, really to begin with, the entire batch should be ground. But what happens if they only did half of it? You know, the, the, the mixer broke, you know, and, and there, was a, uh, there was a lockdown in the city, they couldn't go get a new mixer, whatever the reason was. So then, as long as half of it has been ground, then that is kosher. However, uh, as far as if it was only a third or a quarter of the 368 monim that was ground up, whether that's kosher or not, he says that we never heard about. We don't have an exact instruction whether that would be kosher or not. Omar Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda said, Zahaklot, this is the general rule. Im kemidoso, that if the Kohen ground and added each ingredient for the ketoret according to its right proportion, the ketoret is kosher, kesher lachatoin, even if only half the amount of the ingredient was prepared. So in other words, the proportions need to be heated. Okay, so even if in totality only half was done, but the, the ratio, the proportion of everything was the way it should be, then it is kosher. But if the person, God forbid, left out even one of its 11 ingredients, then he would deserve the death penalty. We're on page 10. Tanya, furthermore, the oral Torah, the Mishnah, tells us about the Ketoret. What is it going to tell us now? The fact that as they would utilize, you remember, they use 365 money during the year, right? And then the extra three, the coin Godel would take from it with his fist and take it inside the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur to burn. So then what would happen is at times there would be some extra left. So here this mission is going to address the extras. Tanya Barkapara Eimer Barkapara says, Achas Lashishim or Lashivim Shana every 60 or 70 years, right? Because on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol took two handfuls from the three monads, from the three extra monads. So every 60, 70 years, all these extras that were left, because imagine the three monads were roughly about three pounds, and the Kohen Gadol grabs with his hands, right? It takes two handfuls. So not necessarily all the three pounds would be used. So now this would accumulate one year, two years, three years. So before you know it, this extra in the batch was growing bigger and bigger after 60 or 70 years. So what would happen then is So the leftover ketoret would add up to 184 manim which was half of a year's worth of ketoret, right? So it was already big enough where it would be enough for half a year. So when that happened, the Kohanim only needed to make another 184 monim for that year's ketoret. So at a certain point, they would make sure that it's not going overboard. They already have for half a year left over. They only would make the additional half. 
which according to what we learned in the previous Mishnah would be perfectly kosher because they would only keep the ratio of the Ketoret and that would suffice. And there, uh, furthermore, Bar Kapara also taught if they would have put even a few drops of honey into the Ketoret, that it would have smelled so good that no person would have been able to hold themselves back from the beautiful smell. It would have knocked everybody off their feet from the beautiful smell. And so why didn't they put honey into the Ketoret if it was so amazing and we know honey is kosher, you could eat honey. Because the Torah says clearly that you should not offer any yeast or honey as a fire burnt offering to Hashem. So we have a clear commandment in the Torah against utilizing honey. So therefore, even though they knew it would be amazing to add it to the mixture of the Ketoret, they said, no, sir, no can do. And this concludes the learning of the Ketoret for uh, today's lesson as far as what was done in the Beit HaMikdash. So it was this Ketoret uh, that was utilized in the desert when Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu to go ahead and make the Ketoret for the Mishkan, for the mobile tabernacle and offer it on a daily basis. And that is exactly what Moses told Aaron to go ahead and use to stop the plague and the sickness uh, amongst the Jewish people. And lo and behold, it stopped immediately. And that's why the Zohar tells us, for those that joined us late in the class, we learned from the Zohar, that the Zohar tells us that whoever recites and learns properly Every day, in other words, what does he mean learns? He just doesn't uh, rattle off the words, but thinks into it, into the words of the formula of the making of the ketoret, of the incense, then that person is going to benefit from a special protection against not only plagues and diseases, but also from any bad decrees on that day and from any powers of the impurity that would want to disturb that person or have an effect on any aspect of that person's life, which is the reason why this section of the Ketoret that we just learned has been incorporated into daily prayers. Before we start the morning prayer, it is mentioned in there, and we also say it before the afternoon prayer, so twice a day, and actually in the morning prayer, we also say it after towards the end of the morning prayer and the Zohar uh, and Kabbalah explains the reason for the repetition of that uh, in the morning prayer is so the first one is in order to make sure that there's protection and then it explains because the Ketorid is so powerful and then it clears the air from any impurity so to say for that person and that person is able to pray and the prayer has now a special value, a special connection to Hashem, and there is levels of, of purity, light of holiness that is being drawn down with this person's prayers. Therefore, towards the end of the prayer in the morning, parts of the Ketoret is said again in order to make sure that the external powers of impurity, as they're called in the books of Kabbalah and mysticism, the Chitzonim, should not have any part of it. So basically, it's almost like you're sealing for yourself the, the purity and the godly light that you have drawn down to yourself and to your, to your surrounding with your daily prayer. So before you start, you say this Ketoret, and after you finish in the morning, you say it so that it's like hands off. Let this light of purity just stay pure, without any external powers having access to it and let it permeate our life. So, in the handouts that I have given you, we, there is more to be learned and we could continue learning that at uh, the next class. 
which is learning the laws according to Maimonides. Maimonides goes a little bit more into details about the making of the Ketoret. Uh, but for now, I think today we have covered a lot about uh, the prayer of Ketoret and its amazing, amazing spiritual uh, powers and what it accomplishes. Maybe Hashem's will that our learning of the Ketoret and saying it on a daily basis with proper kavana, with proper focus and, and mindfulness uh, will be the catalyst. First of all, to bring uh, absolute refuah shalema, speedy recovery to all of those that need. And we know, unfortunately, these days, many, many, many people need a speedy recovery. And uh, let it be just as suddenly as everything came upon the world and, and made people sick, so too, just as suddenly uh, with the merit of our mitzvahs. And of course, by heeding everything that the health professionals have told us, we should have this host the merit of a, just as suddenly it should leave the world. Everyone should have an absolute and speedy recovery. And God willing, we'll be able to celebrate in person all together in the Beis HaMikdash, in the Third Temple in Jerusalem. And hopefully the scene that you see behind me will be something that will be able to be seen by all of, by all of us in person and live. Not a drawing, not an illustration, but the real Kohen Gadol doing the daily service and bringing the special offerings. Amen. So have a wonderful day, everybody. This concludes our class, our class for uh, the, the Zohar class today. And now I'm going to open it up for anyone that has a question. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Yes, go ahead, Beth. Okay, you're unmuted, Beth. Go ahead. I cannot hear you. Hold on. Unmute, sorry. Okay, I have Am unmuted. I unmuted now? Yeah, I'm, the, I'm good. The prayer book from which you took the, the reading today, uh, or I had it, I think, from last time, too, but... Um, uh, yes, by the way, the, the, from the previous class that we had, Kegavna, that we learned about the prayer of Friday night. Um, I had included at the end of that handout, I had included the Pito Makatora because ah. I was hoping that we're going to get to it soon. So I had already ah. put it in there, but I have now rearranged it and I made it its own handout for the sake of this class. Okay, thank you. And but could you tell me the name of the book from which it came? So first of all, in any prayer book, in, in any siddur that you would pick up, it's there. Of ah. course, I try to choose a bilingual siddur. So the bilingual siddurs that we have in our Chabad house uh, also has their translation. However, the particular one where I took this from is a bilingual siddur that is printed by Tzivus Hashem. Tzivus Hashem is a, um, an organization, a Chabad organization dedicated to uh, anything and everything for children. So in fact, this Siddur was created so that it makes um, prayers more inviting for children, but, but they didn't realize that it became a huge hit for adults. So everybody buys them and, and uses them because it explains everything so nicely. So I made copies and I scanned those pages out of that Siddur. And by the way, it's called the Weiss edition. So it's from Tzivu Hashem. And it's the prayer book called the Weiss Edition. And it comes in two different volumes. There's one for weekly pr uh, prayers and one for Shabbat prayers. I, I think Dave has one. Who, me? Yes, I think you have one. Doesn't I think you? I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right. Thank you, Rabbi. Pleasure. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be well. Bucky, any questions? No? Okay. Well, uh, Beth and uh, Bucky and Gennady and uh, everybody else, Larry, uh, and of course, Sonia was also on today. Uh, it's so nice to have everybody join the class. And God willing, we will uh, continue. All right. Have a wonderful Thank day, you, everybody, Rabbi. and stay healthy. You too. You too, Rabbi. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.